Hello everyone, this is Brox Gags, and in this video we're going to look at analyzing a planar frame system. And so you've got the, the frame before you there. Uh, it's a fairly simple system, you've just got three different members, um, one, two, three, four different joints if you will. Uh, joint A there is a fixed connection there. Uh, B and C are supposed to represent pin joints that are connecting the three different members. And then D on the right hand side, on the bottom here, is a fixed pin joint there. As far as loadings go, uh, we want to impose an 800 pounds per foot loading, uh, moving horizontally from left to right along member AB. Then we've got two concentrated uh, point forces along the top member uh, BC there. You can see one at 6,000 pounds, the other at 3,000 pounds there. As far as the source for this actually problem, uh, it came from this book by Hibbler, uh, Structural Analysis there. So if you want to check out it, uh, the theory behind it more in detail, um, I'd suggest looking up that reference there. And so what I've done is um, went through this statically determinant beam and analyzed it using theory, so to speak. And I've got the shear and bending moment plot for AB, and then there's BC here. And then CD is just in axial compression, so there's really no shear and bending moment plot. And so what we're going to basically do is see if we can get the same information from SOLIDWORKS in terms of the, the shear and bending moment plots. And so here's the model in SOLIDWORKS. So I've already got it modeled up using weldments. And I've got some concentrated, or not concentrated, but I've got reference geometry points here at points 1 and 2, uh, which will give us references to apply those concentrated forces to this top horizontal member. And so with the CAD part of it, as far as the geometry creation already in place, now we're ready to go into the simulation side of things. And so first off, if you're going to do simulation, you've got to have the appropriate add-in in. And so I'm going to come right up here next to options. You've got the drop-down arrow there, go into add-ins. And really, I'm just confirming that I have SOLIDWORKS simulation added into this session of SOLIDWORKS. Uh, here you can see it's clicked on both the left and right-hand side. Um, I use SOLIDWORKS simulation enough that I like it to be added in as soon as I start up SOLIDWORKS there. I'll wait for the extra load time, if you will, uh, just so I can have that convenience in there. But at the very least, make sure you add it into your active session. Uh, with that, that should give us access to the simulation tab. And so we'll go from the simulation tab, not clicking the study advisor, but clicking the down arrow, and I'm going to say new study. So we've got a lot of different studies we could run inside of SOLIDWORKS. I'm just going to pick the very top one here, kind of the very basic static study, and accept it. So now you can see the tree is broken into two parts, if you will. Uh, the lower part of the tree is what I'm interested in at this point. That's kind of the, the CAD side of things here. And so I'm just going to work my way down this tree structure. First thing we have is a way to access the individual bodies. And so here I've got three different bodies. Um, if you're familiar with weldments at all, um, SOLIDWORKS basically makes weldments as multi-body part files. And so each one of those bodies is reflected here. And so you can see there's solid body three, two, and one there. The little icon next to it, the little I-beam shape, means that they are modeled it with beam elements, which is what I want. In order to have shear and bending moment diagrams, I need to have that type of element, so I won't have to make any changes there. And if I pull this out a little bit so I can see the entire notation there, you'll see that there's no material applied. And so I'll need to apply material to all of these bodies. Really, for this analysis, it's not going to matter a whole lot, so I'm just going to right-click and apply material to all bodies and make them all the same. And let's just say it's some A36 structural steel. Here we go, and I'll apply and close, and now you can see that material is reflected in each of the individual bodies. I know that you don't have to have all the bodies be the same material, uh, but in this case I'm going to just for convenience. As far as joint group, um, it doesn't hurt us to go take a look at that, and so I'll right click on joint group and go into edit. And really I'm just looking at the how SOLIDWORKS created the joints. And so if I look at my model, I can see uh, four joints here. Um, there's four nodes or joints we talked about in the theory side of things, and they're accurately reflected here. Basically a joint connecting the members at the top left, the top right, and I've also got these joints down here below where I'll tie it into the actual fixtures holding this thing in place. And you can see they've been named joints 1, 2, 3, and 4 there by SOLIDWORKS. So everything looks good here. We don't have to make any changes. Um, I'll just go ahead and say yes, it's okay if they are recalculated because I haven't really done anything yet. Fix, or connections I don't really need, um, so I'm going to jump down into fixtures. And the first thing I'm going to go to is this fixed geometry from the, the context menu. And so 
fixed geometry here that should constrain um, all degrees of freedom, um, rotational as well as translational there. And if I go back to my, my theory, joint A here was supposed to be a fixed joint, and so that's going to be this member right here, or this joint I should say right here. And so I'm just going to select it, applying this fixed geometry condition to that joint, and I'm going to hit OK. Next thing I look at is I've got a fixed pin joint here at D, so I need to apply that in my model. And so I'm going to right click on fixtures again, I'll go to fixed geometry, but this time instead of fixed geometry, I'm going to slide down here to use reference geometry. And so the joint that I'm applying this to is this joint here. And to use reference geometry, you've got a bunch of different options here to define how you want to control the translational and rotational degrees of freedom. But in order for these to make sense, you have to specify some reference plane. And so I'm going to specify the front plane, which is the plane that the, the truss is actually in as my reference plane. And so now we have to look at these degrees of freedom. Uh, notice if they're grayed out, then basically SOLIDWORKS is not imposing any information on that degree of freedom. And so for instance here, <clears throat> it's a fixed pin joint, and so I don't want it to really translate in any way. I don't want it to slide in any direction. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to zero all these out which basically says, hey, that joint cannot slide in the x, y, or z direction. On rotational degrees of freedom, um, I think of this pick, fixed pin joint, and really I want to, to be able to rotate about a axis that is perpendicular to the plane of the frame itself. And so in this case, the plane, the axis is perpendicular to the front plane, or if you want to use this coordinate system, it'd be the z direction. And so the way these icons work down here is this is a long plane direction one, this will be a long plane direction two, and this will be normal two plane. With the front plane selected as my reference, that translates to this along plane direction one being the x axis, long plane direction two being the y axis, and normal to the plane being the z axis. And so what I'm wanting to say here is, well, I don't want it to rotate about the x axis, I do not want it to rotate about the y axis, but I do not mind and will allow it to rotate about the z-axis uh, if that's the way it needs to rotate uh, for the deformations of the members to be correct there. And so that is my arguments as far as my selections in the rotational area. And so that's looking pretty good. Accept that. And really I'm going to apply one more set of uh, relations or fixtures here, and that's going to concern these very top two. And so I'm going to go right click, I'm going to go back to fixed geometry, I'm going to still go to reference geometry, and then what I'm going to do is select both of the top ones. So I want to apply the same conditions to both of these. And then I want to select the front plane as well as my reference. And so what I'm really doing here is I'm going to say, well, I want this to be a two-dimensional problem, so I don't want any movement outside of the plane. And so by movement, I could talk about translations here. Uh, so I've got the front plane selected, and the frame is lying in the XY plane. I want those things to move in the X and Y directions. Uh, these members, the actual beams themselves, are going to uh, not be rigid, but they're going to deform, and that deformation is going to cause a displacement of those joints, and I want to be able to capture that in the study. So I'm going to leave those grayed out. But what I don't want to have happen is I don't want to go out of the plane, and so I'm going to say, hey, let's make sure that this thing does not translate in the Z direction at all. As for rotations, these are supposed to be pin joints, and so I'm going to say, hey, don't rotate about the X or Y, but it's okay if it rotates about the, the Z direction there. And so we're in good shape at this point. Now, even though that applied the, the fixture to the joint, I also need to apply that pin joint to the interaction between the members itself, as far as how those elements talk to each other, if you will. And so that's actually going to have to occur up in the body section. I forgot to do that earlier while I was here. And so what I'm looking for is that horizontal member, since that'll be the easiest one since it's tied between the two of them. And what I'm going to do is right click on it and go into edit definition. And so when you edit the definition of a beam element, it allows you to confirm, hey, it's set up as beam elements. I could switch it over to truss if I wanted a more simplified model and if it fit my analysis. But what I'm interested here is the end conditions. By default, when you have beam elements inside of SOLIDWORKS, they're going to be rigidly connected there. And so you can think of a rigid weld joint there. What that would keep would be that it would keep that this nice little 90 degree angle stays truly at 90 degrees. But I want these to be hinge connections. And so what that means um, for a hinge connection is that this 90 degree angle can change now due to the loading. And so 
this hinge or that pin joint connecting the members is what I need to apply in order to tell that to SolidWorks. And so I've made the connection there, that should be fine. So we've done all the body, we've done all the fixtures. Now, of course, we just need to load the frame itself. And so 800 pounds per foot on member A, B, that's on the left one here. And so I'll right click on my loads, go into the force. Here, I can apply it to a vertices, a point, a joint, or a beam. Well, I want to apply this across the length of a beam, so I'll click it. I'll click the beam that I want it to apply, applied to. I'll click a reference plane here, so I'll just stick with the front plane. Change my units over to IPS. I do want it to be per unit length. And I don't want a moment, I want a force. And then I start clicking here, that very top one along plane direction one in the X direction does give me what I'm looking for. Now it's just a matter of changing the magnitude. You can see the unit SolidWorks wants is pounds per inch. And I've got pounds per foot. And so what I'll do is just say 800 divided by 12 is roughly 66 and 2 thirds pounds per inch there. And so I'll let SolidWorks do the math for me there and input the equivalent value for the loading. And so we'll accept that. You can see the arrows are pointing in the right direction, so everything looks good there. Now I just need to apply the, the point forces on top. Uh, the first one, 6,000 pounds. So again, we'll right click into external loads, go to force. Here I want to apply it at a point, so I'm going to leave that top selection. I'll select point two. Again, I need a reference, so I'll just pick the, the front plane. You change over units. Uh, here it's going to be in the Y direction, so it'll be this icon. I can just flip the arrow around afterwards to make sure it's pointing down. And we're at 6,000 pounds. So that's looking good. And then once more, I'll do this one rather quickly in order to get the 3,000 pound load in there as well. So we're just repeating that same sequence of steps in order to apply that load. So I believe at this point we have all the setup work really done in order to get our truss to run. So I'm just going to right click on mesh and I'm going to tell it to mesh and run. So it's going to go through and create the mesh really quickly and then it ran the model. And so here's our result plot. Uh, the first one pops up as you can see the upper bound axial and bending. Really for what we're looking at we're wanting to investigate the shear and bending moment diagrams. And so what I can do is right click on the results. They're actually going to be in defined beam diagrams. And I'll just try the first one, shear force and direction one. I'll change it over to pounds and select the result there. Um, I'll right click edit. I can go into chart options. I'll change it to the floating as well. And so here is the result we have. Um, we said that this member here was in pure uh, compression. And so it makes sense there's no shear force there. Uh, we've got a triangular shaped uh, shear diagram for this vertical member, which looks appropriate for this distributed load, that uniform the distributed load. And then I've got these rectangular regions in my horizontal member here on top, which makes sense due to the, the concentrated forces there. Now let's just check a value here. It looks like the largest absolute value of the internal shear force on this vertical member is 12,000 pounds. And so if we go back to the theory side of things, we'll come in here and notice it's also 12,000 pounds. That's exactly what we said it was going to be. And so things are looking good here. Um, just to show, one of these will be non, basically zero in this case, and so if I go to shear force and direction two, notice the values are all, all zero there. And so in this type of situation, so we have this planar problem, um, basically we've got two different items for shear force, two different items for bending moment. Basically one of them will be good, it will have good data, non-zero values. Uh, the other will just have these zero values, because there's not a, a bending moment or a shear force in that direction. And so then to show the bending moment, I'm going to define the beam diagram. I'll just try a moment about direction one, change it to inch pounds. Uh, notice I'm getting some interesting shapes, I guess. But notice the legend here on the right-hand side. Uh, basically, we're at zero all the way up and down. And so this is the non-valid result. Not really non-valid, but not really worth much. Doesn't bring a lot to the, the table. And then I'll go to direction two. And notice I have some, some non-zero values here. Um, I'm just going to right click and then change it over to, to floating as well from scientific. We'll just go to zero decimal places. And I have something like this. So you've got this nice little parabolic uh, shape happening here on the bending moment here on the, associated with the member that's filling the uniform distributed load. And we've got this shape here for the 
horizontal member, which also looks appropriate, um, just to check the model. Here's a largest value is 1,080,000 inch pounds, and I've got 90,000. This would be in foot pounds. If you do the conversion, it is 1,080,000 inch pounds there, and so looks like we're in good shape for this model. And so that's how you explore shear and bending moment diagrams with your beam models inside of SolidWorks. Uh, thank you for watching the video, and hopefully this helps you uh, with analyzing beam and frame structures.